Hey, what's happening, Miguel? Thanks for coming on today, man. How's it going, brother? Thank you for having me. It, of course, man. Of course. I'm glad. I'm glad we're able to connect here and and chop it up. So let's just jump right into this conversation. You know, you we're catching up pre-show. It was fun to connect, but I want to share what you have to to say and your expertise and experience with our community. So before we do that and and jump into some of the work that you've been doing, can you lay the groundwork for everyone and just give them a brief, you know, insight into your origin story and how you got to where you are? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not very different to many PT strength coaches, ATs. I was a, a frustrated athlete growing up with a, a slew of injuries. So I was in and out of PT clinics. And that's kind of how I fell in love with sports medicine. So, you know, naturally, I got a degree in athletic training, uh, then became a grad assistant uh, at Florida State and uh, studied uh, sports science. And from there, I was lucky enough to have Wes Hart as one of the assistant coaches there. He plugged me in with Colorado Rapids. They were looking for a head strength coach, so I became the strength coach there among different uh, hats I was wearing at the time. Slid right back into the sports medicine setting with LAFC in their inaugural year in 2018 and 2019. Decided a little bit from the team setting, but worked with U.S. national team during COVID in 2020. Also was in the bubble of Colorado uh, consulting there for a little bit. And then uh, my last stint was with Inter Miami as a performance manager during uh, the 2021 season. So kind of been all over, bouncing back and forth from performance to rehab and all that. Two experiences I want to double click on because I think it's super interesting. Two experiences that many people don't have the opportunity to, to enjoy. And that is being a part of a club in their inaugural season. And then also, I love to ask people that are part of any, any variation of the bubble during the pandemic. So <laughs> let's, ask, let's lean into the LAFC experience and just maybe share some insight into what that season was like being a brand new club which what I would argue probably one of the strongest financial backings from an ownership group across MLS at the time. Uh, and just being a part of that season for the first year with that club. I think you nailed it on the head. Yeah. I mean, having a good financial backing is important. And I think there's also difficulties in starting a club and figuring out what your processes and protocols are going to be. Uh, but the team that we had there, I mean, you know, you had Daniel Guzman on the show as well. Everybody had quite a bit of experience and was putting in, you know, their work. And so we were able to, whether it was performance staff meetings, um, whether it was uh, trying to do our own little lectures and figure out, hey, you know, this is what I've been studying, or this is what I wanted to come up and maybe introduce into the club. Uh, we did a good job at that. And then, you know, setting standards for the club. And, and that was happening at all levels. That's, I think, what was great about that organization. For whatever reason, it all just gelled. And I think the results spoke for themselves. I mean, 2018 was killer. 2019, when it was Supporter Shield, and everything was just gelling. So literally the, the, the culture and the standard was set from the beginning. It was like everybody was trying to do their best work for the good of the team. And, and, and it worked out great. Yeah. And you definitely got, you definitely had success. And I always loved watching the journey of that team because it had some people that were part of the organization that, like you said, Daniel was, uh, was on the show previously, but also some players that used to be a part of the teams that I was, I used to be a part of. It was just cool to follow that story and also just see what, like you said, what the strong financial backing and support from a front office and ownership group, what it can really bring, especially to a city like LA that has such a strong ethnic background and soccer is a sport that would flourish and they didn't have outside of the galaxy. So I just think overall, it was just really cool to watch and I love hearing people's stories about that. And so let's pivot here and then jump, you know, two years down the road, the world enters the pandemic and sports must, you know, the show must go on, as they say. And every league kind of followed suit of, hey, let's create this, for lack of better terms, the bubble. And so NBA, where I was at the time during the bubble, and MLS, we actually shared the Disney um the Disney complex. So really just curious on the other side of MLS, you know, how was that experience for you being a part of the bubble? Yeah, I think during that year, nobody really knew what was going on, right? We were all trying to make sense of it. But there was a lot of nuances. And then there was a lot of, well, what ifs, like, we didn't really know, you know, between, you know, keeping people in their rooms, if they had any sort of symptoms, and then, you know, the temperature guns <laughs> to the foreheads, whether or not that was our accurate temperature or not, the nose swabs, they, I mean, I think for 2020 and 2021, I must have had uh, done testing twice a week for literally two years between being in the bubble, uh, between working with the U.S. national team and then being with Inter-Miami. Well, I would say half of the year with Inter-Miami because then finally kind of the protocols 
uh, started to dissipate a little bit. But yeah, it was uh, that was an interesting part. And uh, it was almost like a preseason. It was almost like an expedited preseason where, you know, you're trying to train the guys and keep them fit. But at the same time, if one of them dropped, you're like, holy cow, the next one came in. And then, well, they weren't really sick. And so now you got to train them again, but or you trying to create programs for them on the side and keep it. It was insane <laughs> from that perspective. Every, all hands on deck. Everybody was busy. And even the players felt it. There was always a kind of like a little uh, tension in the air, at least from our side. Uh, you know, I don't know what it was like in the NBA and how you guys managed. Uh, I think it's a little bit less of a group than uh, a regular MLS squad. But there was always kind of like a what's really going on? We don't really know. And, and, and being in Orlando and we have to play outside, you guys at least had the indoors, you know, then there was rain and then there's thunderstorms. It's the middle of the summer in Orlando. And so can you train? Can you not train? We had a whole training back because there's lightning in the area. So now we're doing something inside, like an activation inside at the hotel. And then, yeah, we can train. So naturally technical staff's going to be like, let's get out there on the field. It, it was Anything and everything that could happen that usually happens in the span of three, four weeks in the preseason, it was happening in a condensed period, all while matches that actually mattered towards that tournament. It's funny to hear you say the amount of COVID tests you had to take because in the course of a two-year span, I broke the 400 mark of the number of oh, you, you those it? swabs. and th Well, you know what it was? We, we parked our, our app that the company that we partnered oh, with, yeah, okay. um, I forget, I forget the name of the medical company, but it was an app. And so like, I could literally scroll back from, you know, what was it? <laughs> 2020, right. Then you had the 2021, 2022 season. And during that entire season, you're doing all these COVID swabs. So from what June, May, I think May of 2020 through the finals of the following year of July of 2021, like you could just go back and see all of your, your tests. And it was just, it was crazy. The number of tests that you had to do, but then to your point, someone pops positive, no one really knows what to do. So now you're, we would sometimes have to test twice a day during, and the oh league was gosh. very strict on something. So I don't want to, I don't want to harp on the amount of testing, but it was just funny. You hear like, Oh, we're testing twice a week. Like, man, whew, I, I broke the 400 mark from those swabs and cheek swabs. Yeah, so it was I, uh, I, I an interesting time to say the least. Since I was in and out of whether it was national team or Colorado at the time, and then I transitioned over to Air Miami, I didn't, I wasn't able to like have the same app all the way through. I wish I did. I, I really am curious as to how many times I got swapped. But, uh, it, you know, listen, the show went on. There were games played and people <laughs> were still training and, and, and whatnot. And yeah, it was some very uh, head scratching times. Yes, it, it certainly was. But now let's let's move back. Let's move ahead to you know present day where, hey, you're running your own business. You're, you're combining a couple different things within what it is level of high performance. You're bringing your experiences all together while also pursuing a PhD. So can you provide a little bit of color as to what you're currently operating in within your business, but also what you're pursuing from an academic perspective as well? Yeah, I think my new passion uh, has been in trying to service people outside of sport. And so bringing everything that we had in professional sports, which is a more multidisciplinary team to help take care of certain cases. So, you know, naturally, somebody has some sort of tendinopathy or tendinosis, uh, we understand that, yeah, we can rehab that and all the you know different techniques that we can do, but where does nutrition play into it? Where does psych play into it? Can we get the doctor involved? What To what degree does the doctor need to be involved? So what I've tried to do is organize a team uh, for more so the general public um, in a concierge style for that type of sports medicine uh, practice. And that's really what I've centered it around. So many times it could start off as a rehabilitation case, it transitions into a little bit more of uh, strength and conditioning, and we throw in some sports science stuff. Some people like to adhere to certain wearables, and we guide them through that. Um, and anyways, so that's one part of it. Now, on the PhD side of it, yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been trying to get this uh, dissertation done now for, for many years, uh, between work, life, different teams, traveling across the U.S. Uh, it's been difficult to do, but still, uh, still not going to quit on it. And it's surrounded, or it's basically, uh, the topic is more around, around mental health services and the perceptions of it in, in female collegiate soccer players. So, you know, my, my new passion along with the business has been, you know, how can we get these athletes to feel a little bit more comfortable speaking about, you know, some of their mental struggles, opening up, opening up about it and not seeing it as a weakness, but seeing it as, hey, listen, it's the same as going in the gym, we're trying to get stronger muscles, stronger bodies, more resilient muscles. And the same way, okay, more resilient minds, whether you want to call it mental toughness or however, which way you want to phrase it, 
uh, that makes them feel more comfortable. That's kind of been uh, my focus over the last few years. And, and, and through that journey, through right through the business side, and I, lo- I love you. I love you for bringing the the high performance care from pro sports to the public sector and maybe so the private sector for lack of better terms. I think that's a great model. I think it's needed, right? There's just so much noise that's out there. There's folks like yourself that have the experience to be able to integrate everything. <clears throat> we need more of that in, in the private and public sectors. So from, from that venture to now exploring the PhD and the mental health side of things, where have you found to have success with your athletes when you combine it all? Well, I'd say, you know, most of my experiences, I felt, like I made a big difference was definitely in the RTP phase, like the return to play phase. Because oftentimes you're sitting there with, it's just you and the athlete. There's no technical staff around. There's no other players around. It's just you and the athlete. And you're able to see where their head really is at. You're, you're actually able to have some genuine conversations, or at least I hope people are having some of these general, you know, genuine conversations. And you get to see you know, where they're struggling. Sometimes they could be just struggling because they're frustrated at where they're at in whatever phase in the, in the rehab process. Sometimes they're thinking, shoot, this is a contract year for me. So I have a certain amount of games I need to play in order for me to get back. And you, you see that they're rushing it um, or you see that you know, they're, they're kind of tentative to even get back because they're, you know, they're afraid of re-injury, which is a, a, you know, a real thing uh, with athletes. And so I think the biggest difference is that for me, that, you know, where I feel like I've had most effect is in that RTP phase. I've, I've been able to connect with a lot of athletes and, and speak to them and sometimes even learn phrases in their native tongue and, and, and be able to use that as a, a, as a motivating factor to kind of get them over the hump and, and bring a little bit of their own home to a place where otherwise they just see it as work. The multilingual aspect of soccer, I drastically miss, especially in a space of where you are now, like in the Miami, in the Miami culture, there's, <laughs> I can only imagine some, like even in LAFC, right? Like you have those, those markets have so much right. diversity and, and different international backgrounds. I, I, I miss that. But at, as you were describing, and I'm listening, I'm writing down words and what I heard kind of you talk about, and I, I, I want to share the same sentiment, right? The RTP phase is, for practitioners, I think is the most intimate and most committed time athletes usually are because of the intention and the desire to get back to playing. But what I heard you talk about and refer to was, you know, and these two emotions came to mind, two traits we can talk about here is, is, is the mm-hmm. fear, but then also let's just label it as the performance anxiety component of it too. So within your PhD work and with your experiences, how have you helped athletes manage the fear and or the anxiety when it comes to the return to play process? Yeah, I think anxiety often gets misunderstood as just being a pure negative. Now, it doesn't always have to be that. I think anxiety pending uh, the action that needs to occur, it can actually be beneficial. And, and, and for example, if it's a linebacker needing to make a hard hit tackle, a 100 meter dash, if it's just something outright explosive, sometimes anxiety actually doesn't come into play. Now, if we're talking about competitive dart throwing where it needs to be precise and, and pinpoint, and your hands are shaking, I, I, we got some trouble, you know, or, or in the case of soccer, yeah, like, you know, are these guys completing the passes? I, I think back even of like, uh, you know, I grew up playing baseball, so I think back of a uh, second baseman with the Yankees. I think it's, I don't want to make it, I don't want to confuse it, but I think it was Chuck Knobloch or something, or we talk about the yips. The guy couldn't complete a, a throw from second base, a routine ground ball and, and make the throw, make the out at first base and couldn't complete it. I mean, it was time after time again, it was oh my, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? At the time I was young, I never know what's going on. But now with a little bit more information, you start to realize like performance anxiety really is a thing. And it, and it, and it splits up into two, right? You have trait anxiety and you have state anxiety. And trait anxiety is just like the normal tendency. What, what that individual already within themselves, where they feel the most anxiety or, or, or how it presents. And then state anxiety is going to be more of that physical or, or cognitive presence of of anxiety now that could be just negative self-talk you know not being comfortable and feeling nervousness or in the somatic sense how that presents you know being at sweaty palms elevated heart rate shortness of breath and you know when when dealing with that how how can we help these athletes and and i think what i did one time with one of the teams is try to introduce some like breathing breath work and visualization i combined both and i and i didn't think anything of it from an anxiety perspective, but I just thought of it like, hey, listen, I, I just wanted the guys to relax. But in the research it's shown, obviously we've seen the benefits of meditation and focus and how kind of narrowing uh, your vision instead of like looking at all the extracurricular things that are going off 
on the side of you. We talk about maybe somebody taking a penalty kick in front of 50,000 fans. That's going to produce quite a bit of nervousness for some people. But for the athlete that's able to narrow it in, control their breathing, they'll take the penalty kick no matter who's yelling at them, whether it's home game, away game. So yeah, performance anxiety is a real thing, but if we can harness that energy and if we can kind of zero in and get them to focus on what's most important right then in the moment, I think we're able to kind of reduce a little bit of that nervousness and get them to actually execute the, the skill. I appreciate the perspective of you saying <clears throat> that the anxiety almost gets a bad rap all the time in the sense that it inhibits a lot of behaviors and inhibits performance. But hearing you say, actually, in some cases, maybe it is beneficial, maybe it's non, it's a non-factor. All right. And, and I wanted to bring this point because there's been some athletes I've worked with over the years that, yeah, you could, they would fall in that bucket of, let's call it performance anxiety. But they're also some of the athletes that are the best at reading the game. Like their IQ for the sport is super high. And when you think back, like, why, okay, why is this particular trait tend to be advantageous in sport at certain times? Or even if you think about even maybe some of the artists or business folks that you work with now, like people that may be on the continuum of, you know, higher on anxiety, it almost like makes me think you're, you're, it's, there's got to be some characteristic to it where the mind is just constantly wired and racing and thinking through every scenario, almost paralysis by analysis. And that does have its purpose in sport, I think, maybe even in business, but it's almost like you got to kind of find that balance and bring it back. So that way it doesn't, you don't fall off the edge and, and it's paralyzing, right? So I wanted to just kind of share some of that context and personal experiences I had and some observations I had witnessed through sport. And just curious if you, if you had noticed the same thing, if you could speak upon that as to why is it that you think that anxiety could potentially be a positive thing, not always necessarily a negative thing? Well, I think if they see it, if they, if they see the skill or whatever behavior that you want to observe from them as something uh, that is achievable or easy or something that they innately enjoy, then the motivation is going to be there to execute the, the behavior. You know, there's different theories uh, that that kind of discuss, you know, different behaviors in athletes. But when we're talking about anxiety, I think if they have that internal motivation and they have they understand that they have control of the situation they are more willing to execute uh, the skill just that in itself and i think that's that's what i've seen with some of the the athletes or even some of the, on the private setting you know you, there, are, there are people you know, listen the reality is we all have our issues some sometimes worse than others or sometimes better than others but how we move about life and how we're perceiving it and if we're able to actually enjoy what we're doing, then regardless of what's going on on the external, we're able to kind of still march forward. And, I, and, and I've seen that, yeah, with, in the private setting with certain people, where you say, man, they, they really struggle with this. But when you put them in this setting, they're like, they're thriving. I mean, I've, I've worked with people in the, with their fitness, per se, for example, and they're just very highly insecure. They, they don't know how to go about it. They need, you know, their hand held throughout the entire process. But the second we start talking about their business or their passions or their family, I mean, it's a whole different mood. It's a whole different uh, environment around them. And the same goes for the athletes. I'm sure when you used to work in the MLS, you put a guy in the weight room and sometimes they were like, no chance am I doing this exercise or I don't want to adhere to this or not. Or maybe they do do it and they look not the best, but the second you put a ball at their feet, you're just like, holy cow, like, <laughs> how, where did all this coordination come into play? And they just innately love that. They, that is their sport. That is all that they know. And so that's a little bit of the differences that I've seen, especially with anxiety is like you put them in an uncomfortable situation where they may not know how to, what the outcome is going to be. Then maybe that paralysis by analysis, you know, skyrockets, but if you put a ball at their feet, they're like, Oh, I know how to do this. This is no problem. It's a cake. The, the two phrases that came to mind as you were talking about the motivation aspect and almost like the intention or the environment is, you know, outcome versus goal oriented behavior. You know, those are kind of two phrases that came to mind as you're describing this. So when it comes to those two types of let's label as behaviors, outcome versus goal oriented athletes, how would you describe an outcome versus how would you describe a goal oriented or are they the same or are they different? Well, I would say outcome and process, right? Outcome and process goal oriented athletes or, or, or situations, right? The outcome, you know, what we see maybe is these athletes that have these lofty goals, you know, that are team-based long-term goals, you know, you, you sit them in these kind of individual player meetings and they're like, yeah, you know, I want to score, you know, you know, 40 goals this year. And it's like, 
mate, you, you barely saw the field for 10 minutes last year. So where are you going with this? You know, uh, or they want to make national team or something like that. And they never actually participate in national team. And so you start to notice maybe that they're just trying to hide, you know, they're, they're almost like successfully trying to fail. They're just trying to hide behind that. And, and so that, that outcome goal oriented can be swayed towards that perspective where a process oriented, they still may choose goals that are a little bit, you know, a, a bit more than that, what they can chew, but their mindset is a little bit of that growth mindset where, Hey, listen, I know I, maybe I fell short of this goal, but I'm still willing to learn and work on those weaknesses where maybe in the outcome oriented, they're just trying to hide behind the curtain or hide amongst the team and, 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 and execute the job. And if, if it didn't happen, well, sorry, you know, like it was actually, you know, kind of an outlandish goal. Maybe I'll try better next time. They, they double down on the strengths that they have, but they don't really try to work on the weaknesses that would get them actually to the, these goals that they're trying to set for themselves. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about the players, but I, I would imagine maybe in your experience, you've also maybe noticed or observed similar behaviors or trait amongst the staff, right? The same things that we're talking about here, the performance anxiety, the goal oriented, the outcome oriented, the process. Have you observed any struggles, challenges, or um, maybe even other tools that you, you know, work with staff or hmm, how do I want to phrase this? Are staff facing the same issues that the players are facing or are they different or the same? Yeah, to some degree. I think we all as staff members have pressures to get a guy back probably faster than than what we want or what we feel comfortable based on, on our experiences. Um, I think oftentimes also staff might be feeling burnt out. Um, just purely based on the, the, the volume of work that we're doing and, and, and we're having that sense of burnout. Maybe your, your decisions, your mood, your behaviors around the, the staff and the team isn't the best. Um, you see, I've seen quite a bit of that. I've experienced quite a bit of that. I mean, it, anybody that's worked in, in professional sports, you know, it, it's almost like a badge of honor, right? To say, you know, I've, I've gone this many days, I've this many weeks uh, without a day off. And, and, and you're thinking to yourself, like, is, you know, is this a badge of honor? Or is this a cry for help? You know? <laughs> and, and, and so I think it's important to be able to recognize that. And, and at least from a managerial perspective, if you're managing staff, being able to understand, okay, wow, this, this person really hasn't had a day off in a while. And they've been seeing 60%, 50% of the athletes that we have here. They're always treating these players and the players keep asking for their, for their services? How can we rotate the staff a little bit? How can we give this individual maybe a little breather, allow them maybe even to go do a, a course, a, a CU course, and have somebody else uh, step in or pick up the slack a little bit, just as long as it benefits the organization and it fits the methodology, but just to kind of give them a, a, a different setting. And, and yeah, that, that happens, happened to me. I don't know if it's happened to you or not, or if you've seen it uh, in your time, uh, whether in MLS or NBA, but that definitely that definitely does happen. How would you describe the pressure of the environment of working in pro sports? In what sense the pressure? You mean like if I'm internalizing uh, anxiety, or uh, how would you how would you describe that? You yeah, great. Yeah, let me let me let me rephrase that question. Right when you earlier you said you know the let's say hey the, from a practical perspective, the mm -hmm. pressure of getting someone back on the field sooner, the pressure of progressing a rehab quicker than maybe as expected, right? The, the need and urgency to have everybody available and what comes with being in the spotlight, that kind of pressure. How would you describe that pressure in pro sports? I think you have an elevated level of, of, of pressure and worry if there's not protocols in place to kind of help back you up when push comes to shove. Because I think Athletes and technical staff are always going to try to find the crack and say, well, you know, now I can get back into the field or, hey, we need this guy now. Well, wait a second. Maybe at the beginning of the year, we agreed that these are going to be our standards to getting a guy back or our protocols to getting a guy back. So being prepared for that and everybody being on the same page, both, you know, performance staff, technical staff, and even the players understanding that thoroughly, I think that helps reduce some of that pressure. Now, we're always going to push the limits. And I think that's why you know, we see these athletes return a lot faster than possible because we're always pushing these limits. And sometimes we're letting people out on the pitch or on the court a little faster than we want. Sometimes it's right on cue. But when you have a plan in place and everybody's has a sound understanding of it, I think it reduces a little bit of that pressure. And then now you're just figuring out, okay, 
can I risk on this end to allow the player to begin sprinting or allow the player to be integrated uh, into some passing drills, even though no, it might not be a quote unquote controlled setting, but after you know seeing this drill multiple multiple times, I know that the athlete will survive it and then we can pull them back and continue with the rehab phase and stuff like that. So I, th I think, you know, to sum up that answer, just be having a, these plans and these protocols in place to kind of keep everybody accountable, both the staff, uh, the performance staff and technical staff and the players. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the, the book, The Checklist Manifesto, where, you know, you just have, it just talks about in some industries where it's life or death, you know, airlines, uh, mining, engineering, places where like, if you make errors and mistakes, it's, it's death. Whereas in the sports world, it's not necessarily death, but it is maybe a re-injury, maybe it's thousands, if not millions of dollars missed because of game, man games loss, right? Those things start to add up. So what I, I share that perspective of the checklist manifesto, because as you're talking about process systems, plans, it's almost like you got to have that in place to ease the uncomfortable situation or ease people being comfortable with the unknown, which often rehab and return to play is. So I just wanted to highlight that and just kind of put that back on you. Is that something that resonates with you as you feel like, hey, if you can have these plans and checklists, maybe that helps you be more comfortable in those situations when you have to manage the pressure. I think so, definitely. And, and, and you know, it's all perspective, right? When you talk about, you know, it's not life or death, but for, for these athletes, it might be. They might feel like it's life or death. And especially, you, we talk about like athletic identity and stuff like that. You remove the athlete from their athletic environment. They're, some of them don't know what to do with themselves. So the pressure is there. But again, yeah, if, if things are in order and, and things are set and, and there's a sound understanding, good communication between players, staff, and technical staff, performance staff, everybody's involved, that kind of helps reduce a little bit of that, that pressure. But no, definitely the, the life or death, it, it for sure feels like life or death, I'd say 90% of the time when you're working in pro sports. It definitely does. I, I, there was a phrase you just said in a scenario I want to... I wanna double click on with you is, you know, the idea of athletic, athletic, I, wow, excuse me, that tongue twister, athlete identity. And when there is an injury or they do, aren't allowed to participate due to medical reasons, it mm -hmm. almost feels like their identity is forcibly removed from them because they associate so much of what they do to their sport and being a player. So could you talk about, or maybe share your perspective on how rehab and return to play affects an athlete's identity? I think, yeah, just as you mentioned, you remove a player from their sport and automatically they, they're, they feel lost, you know, and some of the research has shown, you know, people that head into retirement, um, if they have too strong of an athletic identity, they are 1.2 times likely to experience uh, episodes of depression. And then that gets magnified to 3.4 times uh, the risk of having depression in retirement if it was involuntary, meaning like, you know, a loss of a uh, skill, they can't, you know, they can't maintain that level of play, or it could be a career ending injury. So when we're talking about mental health. These are real things that are going on with these athletes when you remove them from sport. And I'm sure you've come across athletes that as they were starting to come to the tail end of their career, you know, they started, you know, maybe I want to get into broadcasting or, hey, listen, I got into investing in real estate or, whatever it may be that they started to realize, you know, I might need to do some other things. It's not removing them completely from the sport because I think you have to have a certain level of focus. And you look at, you know, the late great Kobe Bryant, MJ and Tiger Woods. I mean, they were so dialed in, they were sacrificing everything on the external world, but they were also about their business. And they, so they were moving pieces on the outside to ensure that, Hey, listen, they were very clear there. Whenever that they retired, whenever that was for them, it was, you know, late in the career, Tiger's still kind of hanging in there. We all, we would love to see Tiger win another another uh, tournament in Augusta, but don't know if that's going to happen. But yeah, they were preparing outside of their their world of being an athlete. I mean, these athletes, especially when you get to a professional level, you think about when they started playing from their youth all the way up, all they know is a locker room. All they know is training, waking up, eating, uh, sleeping at the right time, um, and everything that comes with it. Um, so yeah, the athletic identity is, can definitely impede, uh, their mood, their behavior, uh, when they've been removed from, from that setting. I, I appreciate you highlighting that and sharing some of the experiences because it is, it is a real thing that happens you, hearing you talk about the retirement piece and you think about some of the, you know, the, the vets kind of have all their, their, their businesses outside <laughs> or their investments outside to, to set themselves up, right? Like I've been fortunate enough to be around some of those folks that are really business savvy. So 
I see where that becomes valuable when you start to approach a topic of retirement or identity, uh, you know, ironically switching careers from an athlete to a non-athlete. So I think it's important to highlight, and I appreciate you discussing that, you know, and, and I want to pivot here because we kind of spend spending some time around identity, spending time around the performance piece, but really like, I don't want to highlight all the problems. <laughs> like I want to provide solutions here too, and kind of get your right. perspective on, on what we can do to help manage all this. Right. And there's, there's a phrase here that you, you sent to me pre, you know, before we got on here and it's periodizing psychological skills. And I think it's such a unique phrase because we often think about periodization in the, in the realm of return to play and the realm of rehab and the realm of performance training, even in nutrition and dietetics, when you're talking about trying to increase weight or decrease weight. So I'm just kind of like an open-ended question here for you and really just want to see where you take it as far as what is the concept of periodizing psychological skills? Well, there's different skills I'm sure that we can teach the athletes from a psychological skills perspective. One that I thought, and I, and I gravitate towards, uh, is we talked about a little bit of that breathing, visualization, meditation, and how can we periodize that? Now, I wouldn't say that we would introduce that mid-season. I think what, I, you know, what I've done in the past, what I'd like to do when I was in, in Inter Miami, part of the recovery aspect was that. It was 10 minutes of bike, 10 minutes of foam roll, mobility, stretching, and then it was 10 minutes of just laying down in a quiet room, even have the eucalyptus towels out, a diffuser going, and it was just breath work. And then from there, guiding them into situations where they felt or, you know, I, I, I help guide them into situations where they were happy, elated. So, say, listen, pick pick a moment in time or visualize yourself just being happy, whether that's with family, friends, on a vacation, whatever memory, right? And then we're going to hone that in. We're going to zero that in into perhaps a stressful situation. You know, you got five minutes left in the match and you're down a goal or you're at the penalty box about to take a, a penalty kick. And I leave that I'm on. The, I leave, now, how can... And what the result and hopefully the result is positive, but you know, how can we then periodize that throughout the year? So that is just initiating the practice. But what I saw that could have been beneficial is now let's get the technical staff involved. Let's see if maybe the technical staff can provide video clips for them. And now, now we're kind of having individualized uh, psychological skills training for them, especially when it comes to the off season. And it could just be like once a week, or once every other week where they're saying, hey, listen, we, we wanted you to work on certain things. Whether it was, you know, seeing where the ball's coming from, pivoting, your, your passing, whatever it may be. Can we integrate that? Maybe showing them a clip and then having them visualize that, uh, whether it is on a run or whether it is practicing these, these meditation pieces, right? And we understand the, the, the benefits of, the powerful benefits of meditation. But now if we can start to incorporate that visualization and, and, and start to build upon that and it becomes a natural habit, and I think some of those skills then translate onto the field. And actually, some of the research shows that. I think there was, I forgot the article, but it was, uh, they're comparing just visualization training. Uh, the control was just regular training. And then there was visualization and skills training. And both the visualization and skills training, along with the visualization, just purely visualization, not working on the actual skill, outweighed the control. So if I thought if that was possible, how come we can't integrate that in season? What does that look like in season? And what does that look like in the off season? You know, can, can we slowly add pieces of this and build upon it? And, and that was my idea uh, to incorporate some of this skills training. Is there, is, there, is there a world we live in where you can objectively periodize it, right? Like, and, and I'm going to be, I use a very crude example here and, and just kind of provide some context here, right? When you're trying to, increase your strength. You just put more weight on the bar gradually over time, or you move the bar at a certain speed gradually over time, right? A very simple, crude example. When it comes mm -hmm. to what you're referring to, the periodization of the psychological skills, and if we stay along this topic of visualization and visualization with skill, is there an actionable way where we can periodize that to have a more, a more impact on the athlete? I think it'd be tough because at the end of the day, I think what teams and technical staff want to see is the results. So how, you know, can you, there's so many variables going on to say, okay, well, can we quantify the reason why this individual completed 95% of their passes or 70% 70, 70 of their passes? Was it because there was, you know, that kind of skills training or lack thereof? I don't know. Now I'm sure, you know, we're all well aware of the different wearables that are out there. So can we say that maybe uh, they come in and their HRV scores are a little bit better day in, day out, 
and then maybe they're a little bit rest, well rested state when they are doing it. Can we provide some sort of questionnaires in the morning to say, hey, listen, did you do this practice? Did you not do this practice? We saw maybe your scores were a little bit better from an HRV perspective or their heart rate. Uh, is their heart rate data getting better? Although there, a lot of things would influence their heart rate during a training session. So, yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know that you can quantify it necessarily uh, in a, in a game like situation, but the results have been there at least in the control. And I think that's what we like to do in research is, okay, see what the research is stating, but now how is that applicable to us? It's not going to be verbatim from the research studies, but how can we slowly integrate that into a team setting that might, might work for the better, for the betterment of the entire team or the individual, whoever is struggling with that skill. I'm going to, I'm going to throw out a, you know, kind of an idea from left field here. And I'm just spitballing here as, as you're talking through this and kind of thinking through this. You know, in, in right relative to HRV, right? You talked about HRV and potentially mm -hmm. how that you know that is a measurable state of you know balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic state of the nervous system. So if we're talking about data visual, if we're talking not data, if we're talking about visualization, mental visualization, skill visualization, is there any correlation or relationship? Let's say relationship between the quality of that visualization and the level of HRV or the even resting heart rate, right? If we talk about the parasympathetic state of a low resting heart rate, is there any relationship between HRV or resting heart rate or any biometric relative to the visualization piece of mental skills? I don't think that there's perhaps a direct uh, study that they've done, uh, but there are studies that have seen what meditation or breath work can do to yeah, the nervous system, subsequently affecting HRV. And so I think, you know, going back to my previous statement, where we look at these studies that are, you know, perfectly executed and everything is nice and controlled in a great setting. Okay, what would be the best practice for us, though, now in a real life setting uh, when we're out on the field or we're traveling or what, whatever it may be? What are the tools that we have in our hands? And so, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't answer on that uh, if there's actually been like an, an article and maybe there has been specifically for that. I haven't come across it. But I do know that the benefits of breath work, benefits of meditation and, and how, how that affects your nervous system. And so the idea is, okay, can we, can we expand that onto uh, some of these skills? And I, I wasn't looking for an answer. It's probably more of like, hey, let's just have a thought experiment here and, yeah, and, yeah, see, yeah. and see what Miguel has, has had this idea. Because these are some of the thoughts that were coming through my mind. It's like, hmm, like how can we provide some objectivity to it? Because I think that's what's the, I don't want to say frightening, because that's not the right word, but almost the level of uncomfortability with measuring the mental skills of mental health, whether it's psychology, psychiatry, right? I think some of that is difficult to measure at times. There's some pretty savvy practitioners out there that are finding ways to measure that. But I think in comparison to what we often associate with traditional sports science, performance rehab, the measurables aren't necessarily there because perhaps the commercial products aren't available yet in market to provide to everyday practitioners. So I'm always just curious for people that live in that space, if they've come across anything. So by all means, I wasn't looking for a detailed, well back research answer, just more of a general curiosity on my end. Um, but one yeah. thing that came to, came to, oh, good, good. No, yeah. I was gonna. I was gonna say, yeah, like it's it's tough, right? Because I think uh, in the world of, I guess, psychology, everybody's kind of looking for objectivity, and, and you know, how many scales are we really going to give an athlete, you know, or how many questionnaires are we really going to give an athlete? But I think you had another guest on your show is like, okay, well, if an athlete is giving you uh, is stating something and they state it multiple times, more than multiple times, you know, then okay, then that might be holding true. I think it was confidence. If, if the athletes give, you know, saying I'm not really confident or yeah, sometimes in the situations I'm not too confident. It's like, well, wait a second. Can we quantify the amount of times in which they're saying that? And so while it is something that they're subjectively reporting, I think you can kind of try, try to objectify and say, okay, listen, clearly this athlete is stating something that they're struggling with let's how can we best address it and then you know going through the steps uh, on that sense but yeah i don't know hrv uh, i thought about hrv because you know that's what's affecting or can be related to the nervous system and stuff like that and if you know the practice of meditation and breathing can help uh, help foster that then maybe that can be a quantifiable way of measuring it but again 
we're measuring so many things in, in pro sports anyways. It's like the sports scientists are probably like, no, please, we don't, we don't need any more, you know, like what, what else are we going to measure? You know? No, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and for context, you know, you're referring to the episode with Dr. Alex Auerbeck, sports psychologist who used to work with the Raptors, uh, doing some pretty <clears throat> savvy things in the NBA at the time when he was there relative to putting some objective markers to drafty interviews when you're looking at acquiring players during the draft process or even talent identification when you're trying to, you know, you're at the trade deadline. So be sure to check out that episode to, to learn more about how to provide some objectivity to, like you had said, statements or subjective areas. So that was, I appreciate you, you calling that out. You know, but one thing I wanted to double back on is this idea of motivation too, right? Because I think, not I don't think, I would imagine that the level of comfort and confidence someone has when they go through these visualization exercises or their ability and belief in their own self directly ties to the motivation aspect of how they're, you know, how they behave in the locker room, how they behave on the field. So I really wanted to get your perspective on, you know, what do you think affects an athlete's motivation and how have you in your career helped people be more motivated within the world of sports? Yeah, there's, you know, we all have come across those athletes that never want to step in the weight room. <laughs> and so how do you get them to get into the weight room or, you know, hey, buddy, you, you got about 150 meters left of high speed running. I think we need to have a little bit of a top up here. What are you talking about? I just spent, you know, 90 minutes on the pitch. Why do I need to do a couple more sprints? Yeah, listen, I, with the with motivation, I think if there's an intrinsic desire, if they can, if you can convince them intrinsically that this is something beneficial for them then I think their behaviors or their mood will change to actually execute the skills. So, you know, there's, there's a theory called the self-determination theory. And, and, and basically it's all human beings have, have, have three basic needs. And that's the sense of competence, autonomy, and relatedness. So competence being like, like hey, listen, I can actually execute this, uh, this task or this skill, right? Autonomy is like having a, a sense of agency, right? Like I could, you know, I, I feel like I'm actually doing this. I'm not, you know, having my hand held on this or, or I'm choosing to do this on my own. You're not telling me I have to do this. And then relatedness is kind of it's kind of self-explanatory there. It's like, do you feel like connected to, I guess, your peers in this sense? And so we all seen like athletes walk into the gym. Uh, we've had athletes, you know, come in and be like, uh, you know what, I'm not going to do this. And you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my own thing and stuff like that. And so oftentimes we take that personal, <laughs> like, well, wait a minute, how come you're not going to do the program that we're all doing and stuff like that? But if we take a step back and then maybe realize, okay, like maybe the athlete is just struggling because he doesn't want to feel ashamed that he's not putting up the same amount of weight that some of the other guys in the, in the weight room are doing, or he just doesn't even know how the movements doesn't feel comfortable with the movement. So how can we show them the skill and, and, and let them know that, Hey, listen, you'll be able to do this. You'll be able to execute it. And then maybe even providing options. So a classic example, like the Nord board is, you know, Nordic hamstring exercises. That's a really, I don't want to say taxing, but you know it. You feel it in your hamstrings, and everybody that's done a Nordic uh, hamstring curl, you you know when you're doing it properly, you'll know you, you're you're doing it properly. And so for these athletes that are maybe real novices in the gym, that's a difficult task. So how do we get them to connect with the rest of the players in, in in the weight room and get them to execute our program that we have designed along with the training sessions with the technical staff and know that hey listen by doing this you're going to be better prepared uh, to to withstand the matches that are ahead and the training sessions and I'm kind of get, <laughs> going on a on a rift here but uh, as far as motivating the athlete yeah I think having them become familiar with some of these things and giving them the confidence. And letting them know like, hey, listen, internally, this is going to, or in, that internal motivation of like, hey, this is going to benefit you. Now, from an external perspective, hey, listen, by, it's not that doing the, the, the strength training is going to provide more goals for you or, or have you score more goals or you're going to get a new contract because you just got stronger. That's not really the, the, the KPI for these athletes in, in getting a new contract. But if you're healthy and you're on the field more, that that may result in more goals or that may result in more playing time, which then can lead to a contract extension or more money or whatever it may be. Where have you had success in, in providing those options or getting like the, the three words that you said, competence, autonomy, relatedness? And let's just harp on the word relatedness because that's probably the most one of the more important ones when you talk about a team setting. Where have you had success in increasing the relatedness when you have some of those difficult cases within a team setting? I think I go back to the RTP process, you know, while those conversations having with them in private provide so many uh, 
so much context to where their head is at. I think reeling them back in and allowing them to be a part of the team during that RTP process is important. So getting them in the gym, maybe they have, maybe they do have a hamstring injury or a knee injury or an ankle injury, but that doesn't prevent them from doing the upper body work. So creating maybe uh, getting with the strength coach, or if you are the strength coach in that setting, you know, building a program, you know, and, and during their RTP phase where, hey, they can integrate into the gym and being around them. So in that way, when you get them back, healthy it's not like they're completely lost and they actually feel like they're a part of their group they're not just you know prancing around the facility while the team trains then they can come out onto the field and then they're eating at a different hour for for lunch and then they got to come back for a second session to be treated they're not in the locker room bantering with the guys playing ping pong in the locker room you know with with everybody because they got to do treatment they got to go to a doctor's appointment no hold on how can we make it more comfortable for not more comfortable how can we make the athlete feel more comfortable by being around their teammates because again we're going back to athletic identity these guys that's all they know they live for that they wake up to go and banter with you know their their pal next to them in the locker or whatnot and so i think in the rtp phase being able to i guess at least that's where i've seen the most success is being able to reel them back in give them bits and pieces uh, back in with the team and that could also be on the pitch it's like can we afford maybe 10 minutes of them just you know juggling a ball outside while the team is training versus saying, hey, no, you have to get treatment at this time and you got to be in the gym. And then when the team comes in, that's when we can bring you out and train you. It's like, well, wait a second. What if we're out there doing that RTP while the team is training, the guys coming around during a water break, hey, man, you're looking great. And then that encouragement and that support to kind of fuel them to continue on in that process. I appreciate you highlighting the bringing the maybe the RTP cases out to the the field or pitch, you know, choose which whatever word you want to describe that, right? Yeah. The field <laughs> and have them be a part of it, you know? And, and the reason I call that out is because that was in, in soccer. It was kind of like in my time when I was there, it was very normal to, you know, the guy would stay inside and do his rehab during practice. And then when I got to the NBA, I had, had a particular coach that he never wanted that. He's like, no, like I want all the guys to feel a part of it except in the extreme case where you knew a guy was out for six to nine months, he had surgery, like, okay, it's time to just focus on what, you know, yourself, you know, we know you're not coming back anytime soon. Cause I, I've seen both sides of it. And I, I just appreciate you calling that out because I always felt the players, if they could be around it and be with the, be with the boys, be with the gals, like there's just almost that banter that they need to be a part of, yeah. right. Just to <laughs> feel a little bit like themselves. So I think it's important too, as, as if, if you have the resources, if you have the manpower to provide the rehab or training or bits of it pre or post training, I've just seen the benefits of, from a happiness and joy perspective that they, the athlete gets to be a part of something besides just you know being in isolation and focusing on their specific injury or rehab. Yeah, and I say on the other side of that coin too, as you mentioned, like if it is a long term rehab, sometimes you got to allow the player some time too. Like sometimes you got to let's say it's an ACL we know those take months like you're not just going to have the guy come in and doing the same routine for six months seven months eight months however long uh, they finally get cleared sometimes you actually say you know what go go ahead and and, and, and maybe you have a relationship uh, with their own personal PT that they have in their off season or or you have an affiliation with with a clinic uh, that does help provide support um, sometimes they do need that space that, that hey, listen, I, I kind of got to get away from here for a little bit. And, and as long as there is that trust and as long as there is that communication between practitioners and stuff like that, and if it is possible, if it is something that's uh, permissible within the, within the organization, then I think that's also a big component too is, is allowing the, the athletes to kind of hold on. Let me get a, a breather here because coming in and, 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 and doing the same rehab, being on the same schedule, but not being able to execute uh, – or not being able to play that that's also kind of taxing on the athlete. At least I found. No, you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm glad you bring that example. Cause there was a particular case I had, you know, one year of my career where an athlete needed to get surgery. They're, they live in a foreign country, right? They're not, they're not a domestic player. They're an international player. And they had committed to say, like, I want to get the surgery. I want to take care of myself, but I haven't been able, because I'm getting the surgery in the off season, I get the surgery here. I don't have an opportunity to go home until, you know, I haven't been home in over a year. It was so cool to see, you know, once you get past maybe the acute phase of that surgery, you're in a safe space. Man, he went home. He left the country. He left the team for two and a half, three weeks, and he just came back. And you could just tell he's just like almost like a weight was lifted off his shoulder where he just needs like, man, I just needed to to be a human, right? And I, it's mm -hmm. in sports, I, it's very easy to lose sight of the person behind the athlete. 
you know, because we're so yeah. focused on so focused on getting the back out of the field, making the best performer, making the best athlete out there that sometimes you just forget, you know, they're not really mad at anybody other than the fact that maybe they just need a day off, you know, like, like yeah, every yeah. other occupation, occupation or job out there. So I appreciate you calling that out and, and just given that perspective, because I do share the same sentiment and have, have seen the positive impact that can have when you create the space for people to step away from the environment when it is appropriate. I agree. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, they're human beings. Yes, they're athletes, but they're, they're human beings first. And so for as much technology as we have and every metric that we're measuring, like, man, can we really understand who this athlete is? And, and listen, one of the clubs I was at, you know, as a performing staff, I think we did a really good job of uh, implementing kind of like a proprietary sheet prior to athletes coming in. And it was geared more towards you know, uh, trades, but we started doing that. I think one of the years in the preseason, as we knew new players were coming in and a little bit was just a little bit of a history. Then there was a kind of like a, our own proprietary skill skeletal assessment and stuff like that. Obviously they had to do that in house. I was tasked with the responsibility of calling some of these athletes ahead of time. And some of the questionnaires were simply just like, Hey, listen, do you have a family? Like, do, do you have a wife? Do you have a girlfriend? Or do you have a kid? Are they, you know, are they going to be living with you? Are they not going to be living with you? Where do they live currently? Because then time zone, you're thinking about guys like staying up. You know, I've had an athlete that, you know, would wake up at two in the morning or or stay up till two in the morning speaking to their family because they lived all the way, you know, across the pond or in Africa or whatever it may be. And so how do they come in? And then we, we look at, you know, their performance or their, their, their heart rates. And we're like, man, it's through the roof you know, during a warm up, what's going on, they're probably not fit, whatever, or maybe they're too fatigued. And all it was is like, this guy's just not sleeping, you know, and and, and so when you talk about an extreme case, when they're injured, it's like, okay, well, let first of all, let's let them understand really what this process is going to be, so that they feel comfortable. And okay, how is that going to look like, you know, because if it is a, a bit of a moderate to a long term injury, you know what, let's just right off the bat, Go ahead and, and, and spend some time with your family. We know that there's you know not much to do at the moment outside of kind of like stabilizing the you know, the joint or whatever it may be, um, and then come back. Or maybe we do a little bit of the portion now, allow you to go back, see your family, come right back, and we pick up the pace and then move it forward. So I, I think it's just incredibly important to understand and listen to the athlete, know where they're coming from, because that'll help give them also the confidence that like, hey, you guys actually care about me, not just me being a part of the team or me uh influencing the team it's it's first take care of my situation and then we can go from there and 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 those small steps and those unrelated but related tasks go a long way when it comes like when you got to get the job done there's almost like you've invested the time and energy into the relationship side that you are able to then get you know tying back into motivation tying back in to pursuing confidence right you just i feel like all of that is backed by doing those little things on the back end to help foster that relationship throughout to be able to get the job done at a higher level. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Man, this is this has been great. Really interesting and dynamic uh, perspective here, combining a lot of the mental skills and the perspective on mental health for the athlete. And so before, before we leave this, I think it ties really into kind of one of my favorite questions to ask our guests is, you know, the idea of what are all the small wins that help us keep pursuing high performance in everyday life? And really from your unique perspective, I, I think it'd be cool to ask this question and just understand really how are you defining a small win or how are you helping athletes find their small wins in the grander picture of winning a tournament or winning a league cup? You know, if I were to think about this question, I also think about maybe the, 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 the different type of clientele that I see now because they are – high performers, whether it's in business, whether it's in entertainment. And for me, a small win is, is being able to listen. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes these athletes and, and even these entertainers, they live in a world where they have to have a persona. They have to feel like, you know, I'm the best player. I'm, you know, in, in the case of major league soccer, they're the DP, they're the designated player. They can't show any weakness. They have to do this. It's like, we know behind behind closed doors that you're actually a more sensitive individual or, or you're actually, a, you know, you like to banter, you're funny, but in everybody else in, in, in the limelight, you're, you know, the strong individual with a stern face. Um, so for me, it's, you know, it's being able to listen, having that opportunity because they're going to be able to tell you so much about themselves 
a small win for me is being able to capture those moments and then being able to not necessarily divulge all that information to the rest of the staff in the case of sports, the rest of performance staff or technical staff, but it's structuring things for them that they understand, wow, this individual did listen to me. And now things are kind of not necessarily molded for me, but I noticed that things were changed for the betterment of, of my performance or for how I view things or changes that I feel like need to be made. So for me, a small win is being having the opportunity to listen because I know if, if they're able to open up and I'm able to listen, I know that not necessarily that I captured them, but, but now they're starting to feel more uh, trustworthy of the situation and everybody involved. And so, yeah, a small win for me would have to be being able to listen, just, you know, whether it's on the treatment table, whether it's an RTP, whether, you know, whether it's an off season phone call, Hey, how's the off season going? Good. You know, I'm in I'm on holidays with my, with my missus, but I'm still doing the programming. Great. No problem. You know, and, and those are small wins for me because the more and more I, I get to understand the individual, the more things I can start to implement with them. If, if you don't know who the individual is, they don't know who you are, and you start trying to add too many different things in, into their program, it, it's, you know, you're going to have very minimal adherence. thousand percent, you know, and I, I want to highlight the, the need to listen or the ability to listen is a harder skill than I think most people realize, or they think they're listening, but perhaps they're not. And I share that perspective. The ability to listen and the ability to to be present in those conversations is a lot more challenging. I think we probably give ourselves credit to because I think a lot of people in sports are looking out for themselves because it's such a volatile environment. So the ability to just listen and be present can be challenging, but also is critically important to everything that you just alluded to. Yeah, for sure. And that last question I have for you, it's uh, super fun. Uh, really just love to hear some fun stories that people had when it comes to being in sports, being a part of, right? It's kind of probably some of the excitement that we get to be a part of when you work in sports. So really, <clears throat> really just wanted to ask if you had a favorite locker room story or a favorite sporting event that you got to be a part of. And by all means, if you got it, if you want to go the locker room route, we can certainly speak uh, in Jane and John and not name any <laughs> But uh, it's always, you know, I imagine you've been exposed to pretty cool situations. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think to answer your question as far as a sporting event per se, listen, winning, winning any sort of championship uh, is always fun. And, and, and so winning the Supporter Shield with LAFC in 2019, it was kind of like, man, like all the work that everybody was putting in. Again, we, I, th I think as a performance staff, as a technical staff, the players even, I think at that, that year, Carlos Vela, uh, he broke the, the scoring record at the time. Uh, so uh, everything was going good, but everybody was also putting in the work. So you felt like you had stock in it and it was just icing at the cake of, of the cake, you know, at, at the end of the year, you know? And so, and, and, and the locker room party inside and then the, you know, the, the, the alcohol and the fun and all that, it was, it was a good time, I would say. Uh, but favorite locker room story, kind of keeping staying in the theme I thought was incredible. And again, uh, you know, not mentioning names or teams, I remember being uh, finishing a, a match. We had just won. It wasn't like you know, there was anything bad. But, you know, uh, as we're picking stuff up, I, I go, go to use the restroom before our kind of debrief with the, with the coach. And two of our strikers were in the restroom. One of them uh, was absolutely struggling, like, you know, crying. And our other star player was there to help console him. And I thought that was an incredible opportunity. I, you know, it, it showed the humility of our star player to be able to like console this athlete that was struggling because he wasn't performing well. He had so much pressure to score goals and, 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 and I don't know what else was going on, but you know, he was struggling there in, in the restroom and, and, and it took a minute and, and we actually held the meeting or the debrief with the coach for, for a couple of minutes as like that individual was, was kind of coming back and, and, and feeling a little bit more comfortable to return to the team. But, but I thought that was a good moment. You know, uh, you know, I thought that was a really important moment for showing how a man's vulnerability can be, uh, you, you know, it, that player that, that for lack of a better term, DP didn't have to do that for this player, but he did it. And, and it made for a much more bonding experience for everybody. And, and, and anyways, that was a, a good locker room moment. I think that that resonated well with me. And like, those are the stories that don't like make the headlines, right? Those, but those are the ones that make a break kind of a culture at times, right? Or make a break, you know, how that player fits in with the rest of the team, how you, know, you handle certain situations. So I appreciate you calling that out and sharing it because those are the ones that really do increase the identity of not only the players, but the culture of, of the group. So 
thank you so much for for sharing that with us. I appreciated that. For sure, for sure. Well, hey, this was fun, Miguel. Thank you for setting time. You know, a little bit of time zone difference here. You're you're getting ready to go party out in South Beach, <laughs> and I'm getting ready to wake my kid up from kid up from a nap. So different different times, different <laughs> different worlds. But hey, this was this was fun. Thank you for making time for us, and always of love course. to point people in the right direction to connect with you. So if those wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to either work with you or just learn more from, more about you and your story? Yeah, LinkedIn is is, is an easy way. I think it's that's a, a professional uh, social media platform. And and again, you can you can just look me up, Miguel Motolongo, uh, on LinkedIn uh, from a business perspective. Info at totushp.com. That's info at t o t u s h p dot com. That's another way uh, you can contact us. Um, but yeah, Adam, it was great, uh, speaking to you and, and hopefully, uh, we can have another conversation once I'm done with the PhD and, and give you a different perspective on, on that thing. I, I, I'm sending, sending you all the, all the positive, you know, mojo and juju to hopefully you get that done soon. Cause for the, I've never been through it, but all the friends and colleagues that have been through that process, everyone speaks of, man, it's a grueling process, but so rewarding in the end. So you're almost there, man. I, I'm, I'm Thank cheering you. you on from, from afar. Appreciate you. Appreciate you.